Journey Church, come on. I'm excited that you're here today. Man, honored to be with you. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, my name is Kyle, and I get the honor of serving as one of the pastors on the team here. And I mean, I am overwhelmed with joy. There's so many things that you could have done on a pretty, a really nice uh, Cleveland morning, but I think you chose the right option to be here in church, to be with a community of believers that are actually trying to go a little bit further uh, than where we thought we could go on our own. I'm telling you, if you're at Twinsburg, right side of the map, bright side of the map, you're at the park, Fairview Park, uh, here at Avon, online. I'm telling you, maybe you just like have some coffee ice cream. That's okay. That still counts. Um, save us some. I was going to say save us a slice, but can you save a slice of ice cream? Let's not. Let's move on. Excited that you're all here today. Um, and we're talking about this idea of a road trip. And I don't know about you, but I've been on a couple road trips. And the truth is, they're not that much fun. Um, the first 10 minutes and the last 10 minutes, those are the best parts. But everything in between is like, you know, your sister's slobbing on you, and then you push your head back. Don't hit your sister. There's a lot of that going on. Um, but what happens, actually, is you get these amazing stories because you spend time with these people, whether you like it or not. And what you do over time is you develop relationships. You you develop inside jokes, you start developing a foundation that actually makes you stronger long term. And I think that's what this summer journey is for, is for us to get together in a close space. Hopefully nobody slobs or drools on you today, but I think over time we're going to build a foundation that's going to make this church, it's going to make your marriage, your relationships stronger long term. I'm already preaching this. We ain't even got the notes up. Okay, let's just move forward. The reason that I get a chance to be on this stage is because the amazing road trip that actually God has taken Journey Church on for the last over a decade now. And that's because of our amazing leaders, pastors, Jim and Jennifer Wilkes, man. I'm telling you, they had an amazing call of God on their life. Yeah, we can clap. That's cool. That's cool. I can hear you at Twinsburg. Appreciate that. But they had an amazing call of God on their life, and it's one thing to have a call, but I'm telling you, in the days and times that we live in, where it seems like every five minutes you have to have a new statement about uh, a Supreme Court ruling, a, a massacre in Texas, uh, getting groceries in Buffalo, or in, even now, another act of senseless gun violence just down the street in Akron. I'm telling you, it takes a lot of consistency to keep the weight off of yourself and on to Christ. And I love that they've done that for over a decade now. Thank you guys so much for leading and being consistent, man. This world is gonna keep changing. Y'all keep being consistent. Can we just give our hands a praise one more time? And look, I, I love them. They're cool. <laughs> but they're not cute as my wife, so I gotta shout her out, <laughs> okay? Um, I, I love my wife so much, okay? So much that I married her, guys. Um, just. Let the cat out of the bag. But I love my wife so much. I think we have even a picture of maybe her and I uh, hanging out. Look at this! Look at this! Look at this! Um, but I love her so much, man. Uh, she is holding the family together. I'm telling you, there's not many people that I would trust to suture my arm. She's an ER doctor. It's 6 p.m. Um, it's not just a random stranger. And then actually watch my son at 6 a.m. And even today, like, she got home at 3 she asked me some question. I don't know what it was. I was sleeping. I was spiritually marinating, obviously. Um, but she asked me some question. And then today, she's up at 7 a.m. with our son. And she's being an amazing mom and working all these crazy hours. And I just want to let you know I love you. You're, you're better than anybody could ever think you were. You do so much more. I'm so honored, but I'm also humbled by your work ethic. If, if I do anything halfway decent on a microphone, it's because my wife is all the way turned up behind the picture. So can we just thank God for my wife? Wife. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Come on. I'm happy that you're here and that Pastor Jen and Jim are here and that my wife is here. But can I tell you, man, if we get a chance to hear from the Holy Spirit today, like, let me not waste any more time because the fact that he's here, the fact that he wants to have a conversation with you, and I know somebody's here maybe for the first time, first time in a long time, you're like, what does that even mean? Well, let's talk about it. We're actually going to go to this amazing book that we call the Bible. And where we go to the book, this book, we go here because we know that we're not going to get advice based off of somebody else's experience or Yelp review, but we actually get advice based off of eternity. And I believe that God has something to say about you and your situation and what he has called you to be that maybe you haven't even seen yet. And let's look. I think it's going to come through 1 Kings in chapter 17. It says, Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. 
Then the word of the Lord came to him, him, who is him? This is Elijah. So Elijah is a prophet. So what it is, is actually our God of the universe always wanted to have a close, intimate relationship with his people. But because he hadn't yet sent his son to die a sinner's death on a cross that he did not deserve, he would send people in his place. And some of those people were called prophets. Now, Elijah would hear personally from God. And I got to let you know, I truly believe, Levi, like I believe that God has given me some stuff to tell you today. But like Elijah would call down fire from heaven. Like it's a whole nother level of access, okay? I just want to let you know. So when he speaks, when something happens with Elijah in it, I think we should listen. So it says in verse 9, he told Elijah, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. We'll come back to that. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. In verse 12, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little joy oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small cake of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. Y'all, y'all can have the leftovers. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. Today, I want to talk about the idea of how can we run, how to run on empty, <laughs> how to run on empty. I don't know, but if you have a pulse and you've been alive for the last three years, the world has given us probably about 10,000 reasons to feel like we have to run full speed on an empty tank. And I think that maybe, just maybe, if you're here today and you feel like, yeah, Kyle, I showed up, but honestly, is this even real? I have to go back to real life after this and I, I need a word because right now I'm on empty. I think the Holy Spirit wants to have a conversation with you today. So let's let him in. Lord God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you're doing in this place. I thank you that you have drawn somebody here. Not a great social media post, not an amazing worship team, not a pastor with a microphone, has a candle to hold to the sun that is you. So I pray, Lord God, that I can do my best job of moving out of the way so that you can speak. In Jesus' name we pray. We're listening. Amen, 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 amen. I hate track and field, okay? <laughs> yep, I just went, yep, whole mood change, the keys are gone, we're keeping it real. This is when keeping it real is going wrong. I hate track and field, okay? I'm going to tell you why I hate track and field. Because when I was younger, races were easy, okay? Uh, you go out, two or three of your friends, I want to figure out who the fastest is. Cool, kick your shoes off, get in the grass, here's what we're going to do. We're going to run 10 steps down to the stop sign, boom, hit the stop sign, and then we're going to turn back. That's it. That was the whole race. Like, that was it. And then whoever won, won. And I was actually, you know, <laughs> kind of a smart guy, so I would always make up the rule of, like, you got to hit the sign and come back. I wasn't very fast, so I run, boom, take off, mark, set, go, hit the stop sign, blap, come back. Hey, guys, y'all forgot to turn, hit the stop sign and come back. I'm busting them in the second half of the race. That was the whole race, okay? Ten yards, and I was the fastest. It was a good time for me. Um... But I remember the first time I ran out of gas on, on a real race that they call track and field, okay? Uh, I remember I was 17, and it was like, hey, Kyle, we want you to run a 400. I'm like, okay, sounds like 390 too much, first of all, but we want you to run a 400. So they took me out to the track. They said, hey, here it is, one lap around. <laughs> one lap around, how hard could it be? So I went to go kick my shoes off, and they said, no, 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 weirdo, keep your shoes on. Like, what? You can't kick your shoes off. We're going to run on asphalt. That's not good for your knees. I know that now, and I'm paying the price of it. But for some reason, track and field, this is what we do. And then we get these shoes. Like, you can't wear regular shoes, obviously, because it's asphalt. Uh, so you get these shoes that are basically weapons. They have spikes on the bottom of them. They put those on you and say, this is how we have fun. We're going to go run a 400. So you walk out. And I'm like, okay, I'm good. I, I guess they put lanes here. That's good, because my cousin used to elbow me a lot. Okay, so we know that we should be in lanes. That's helpful. And then they say on your mark, Get set, so then you get on your mark, which that's also difficult, okay? It's basically like a game of Twister. It's like blue, red, yellow, green. Like, I don't know exactly Simon. Like, what is happening right now? But I get everybody else is on blue, so I guess 
Blue is the winner. So I'm going to get on the blue, which is also weird because then they stagger people. Like, in a real, this is a real race, apparently. They stagger people. I'm like, why do they get to stare five yards in front of me? There's a whole message inside of that. I'm not going to preach right now. But, like, okay, people are starting in front of me. I'm on the blue one. And then in the midst of it, they say on your mark, get set. And someone pulls out a gun. <laughs> okay. We're done. <laughs> we're officially done here, beginning and ending my track career. Why are we okay with this? Like, people play international sports for a living around the entire globe. They use whistles, bells, an air horn. Everybody's cool. This dude just pulled out a pistol. All right, I guess that's what we're doing. Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> On your mark, get set, pistol goes off, which we all know um, is a national sign of run as fast as you can. Uh, so we ran, so we run as fast as I can. And I'm, I'm realizing at some point um, that I am underprepared for this race, okay? Because I'm like, I should start out at a slow pace because we gotta go all the way around. This is not hit the stop sign and come back. Um, but then, you start feeling this wind as people are passing you, and you're like, oh, shoot, I can't lose this early in the race. So now I start picking up. I go to top speed immediately, full-on Maverick Top Gun. Like, I'm like, okay, we got to take off. I'm taking off now, and then I'm still realizing, okay, they're not slowing down. I'm like, guys, hey, it's a long race. <laughs> let's <laughs> Come on, let's pace ourselves, right? Um, so they're not slowing them down, and then at the same time, I'm only 17, and I, I, I think I had a heart attack, okay? I was like, oh my gosh, my, this is it. This is the big one, Elizabeth. I'm done. This is it. I'm, I'm officially gone. Did I get shot? Did he shoot? Is that what the... Is it, no one else is bleeding. Okay, I'm not bleeding either. So I did what any good, God-fearing teammate Christian would do. Uh, I pulled off. I was like, we're done. <laughs> you know, we're done. This is not my sport, okay? I'm an athlete, but clearly track and field is the worst. Um, and then my, 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 my track coach runs over to me, and he runs over to me full speed. He's like, Kyle, you have to finish the race. I was like, great, I'm done. Like, what, what are we talking about? I'm finished. Poor fiend, we're done. He's like, no, Kyle, you have to finish the race or else we all get disqualified. There's a whole nother message in that. So I get back on the track and I trudge along. I mean, it felt like Thor's hammer just was hitting me in the chest for the next 300 yards. First and last 400 of my life. Why? Because I'm a good decision maker sometimes. Um... And it's kind of funny if you think about, you know, running a race and being on empty, if you think about it that way and the idea of a race that I should have never been in and I was destined to lose. Um, but it's not as funny when you think about it in the context of, of, of maybe, maybe a widow. Um, this widow has lost everything. The most important person in her life, her friend, her provider, her boo is gone. She would have looked to this person for sustenance. They would have given her a seat. He would have given her the seat at a table that she did not deserve to be at. And now he's gone. Not only is she on her own, but now, <laughs> actually, that would have been better if she was on her own. But instead, she actually has to provide for the seed that they created together on her own. And we don't know much about this little boy. I don't know if maybe he's too young to work or if there's a mental illness there, but for some reason, she feels like he can't even go out and take the, and take the stage of his father and prepare for his mother. She has to do it. I know it's nothing like July 2022 or whenever you may be watching this online, but... Um, See, in that day, we would never do this, but in that day, the socio-political norms were set up that actually a single mother, um, <laughs> she would have been vilified. She would have been outcast. It would have been her fault that she ended up in that scenario in the first place. And so she has no socio-political capital. I mean, there was actually a, a famine in the land. So groceries would have been more expensive than ever. She would have had no ability to provide the natural agricultural way that maybe she knew how or maybe she could have gone back to. She had nothing to sell. She wasn't a business person. She was just stuck with the hand that was dealt to her. And, and I wonder if somebody <laughs> came in here today not to hear some cool jokes about track and field, but maybe, just maybe, you're here today and you feel like, I get where she's coming from. If I have to respond to one more post, if I have to get uninvited from one more party, Kyle, I'm, I'm running on empty. 
The powerful thing about this word that God gives us, though, is he doesn't just leave us in a place of destitution, but he actually gives us some models that we can follow. And even through this widow, I think we find a few things that this widow does that if we should incorporate them in our life, I think it'll teach us how to run on empty and still get to the end of this race, even though we have no room left, no gas left in the tank. It says in verse 7, it says, Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath, and when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. I wonder when's the last time we just gathered sticks. The first thing that I see in this widow story, and I think it's important, if we're going to learn how to run on empty right now, July 22 or 2027, whenever you may be watching this, I think if we're actually going to learn how to run on empty, the first thing we have to do is just honor our commitments. She honored her commitments. She honored the commitment that she had made to be a mom. Yes, I know that my husband is gone, but today, it's Tuesday, so I'm going to go gather these sticks. She doesn't even know if she's going to live to get to the end of the week, but yet she takes a moment to say, I need to honor the commitment that I made before my husband, before the God that I thought I believed in at that moment that clearly has left me by myself, and I'm going to go gather some sticks. I think so often, Pastor Jen, it's the mundane that leads to our miracle. (laughs) And so so many times we want to get on our knees and we want to cry out to God in prayer, but we don't see her doing that. We see her honoring her commitment and gathering sticks. I'm so impacted by this woman because it actually says that she was doing this at the town gate. Now, the town gate biblically at that time would have been where all the merchants were lined up. I mean, it was like, Whenever you walk into Disney and they're trying to sell you pictures for no reason. Like, it, it was like a serious situation. It was like the beginning of Aladdin, like, sugar that's in peace, sugar that's in pistachios. Like, I don't know, that's stuck in my head. But it's like the beginning of Aladdin, all these people are lined up. There would have been businessmen there that are selling idols. It actually says that Zarephath, the name itself, actually means smelting or melting, which lets us know that they were good with precious metals at that point. So they probably had created idols. Hey, you're going out on the boat? You probably should take a picture of Poseidon with you. I can sell you one for four ninety nine. Like there would have been businessmen in that moment who were there, but she was not a business person. There would have been buyers that were there saying, I'm going on a long trip and I need to take something with me on my way out. This is a town gate. I have to stop here before I go to wherever I am headed next. There would have been business people. There would have been buyers. I'm telling you, there probably would have even been beggars. That's the perfect place. This is where all the people with the money, where the changing of hands, where the agriculture is meeting, people that are ready for agriculture, meaning that maybe, just maybe, I can have the crumbs off of your table. I can just have a couple spare shekels. We don't see her as a beggar. We see her busy picking up sticks. When's the last time in the midst of us looking for our miracle, we just did the minimal and picked up sticks? I wonder what picking up sticks looks like for somebody here today. Can I tell you what picking up sticks looked like for me two weeks ago? And my wife is here. She doesn't even know I'm going to tell this story, so I'm going to look this direction. Um, (laughs) Two weeks ago, we were in the midst of um, a discussion, you know, uh, (laughs) This is, this, is, this is, you know, I didn't raise my voice. I'm a man of God, obviously. Um, but we were in the midst of a discussion, and there was so much I felt like, and I don't even think she knows this, but I, I felt like there was so much tension that honestly, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even ready to go home because I wasn't ready to have the conversation. And I was like, ah, you know what? It's this worship night um, down in Columbus. You know, because I'm a pastor, I got to blame it on Jesus. Um, it's this worship night down in Columbus. I just feel like I'm going to get my spirit refilled. And she was crazy enough that she was like, Sure, go. I was like, why would you do that? We're supposed to argue. Um, So I was headed down to the worship night, got my car, and I was ready to go. And in the midst of it, the Holy Spirit had me turn the wheel and argue with him and a couple other people on the phone. And I decided, instead of running away from this, I think I just need to go home, have the tough conversation, and gather some sticks. And we had the tough conversation. It was great. 
more in love than ever before, thank God for it. But I wonder if there's somebody who's not even ready to go home in here today. And it looks like gathering sticks. I can't tell you in the last three years the amount of group chats I've left and then come back to, left and then come back to, the amount of people that I've loved and then run away from, loved and then run away from. And maybe, just maybe today, God's asking you to return that text message, to not put up that post, to maybe just pick up the phone and call that person directly. Maybe, just maybe, in 2022, that's what gathering sticks looks like. We see this woman honoring her commitment in the midst of her calamity. And I am so excited that we see it because what it lets me know, a window into the Father's heart is that even when we are destitute, even when we are downtrodden, even when we feel like we have nothing less and nothing left and we are running on empty, if we can just honor our commitments and show up to work on time to the dead-end job that you hate, maybe that's what gathering sticks looks like. Not cussing out your coworker, knowing God, getting God well that you want to. Maybe, maybe that's what picking up gathering sticks might look like. You know, Jesus himself actually preached on the importance of gathering sticks. In Matthew 6 and verse 11, he's actually teaching his disciples how to do the most important thing in the world, how to pray. And he says, this is what I want you to pray. I want you to pray, give us this day our daily bread. And you're like, Kyle, what does that have to do with picking up sticks? Can I tell you that she was picking up these sticks to go home, make a fire, and make a loaf of bread for her and her son? Maybe it was going to be their last meal ever. She didn't know if they were going to make it to get to the leftovers at the end of the week, but she said, I'm going to do what I can do in my own power today. I am stricken, yes, by the grief of yesterday, and I am unsure of the future of tomorrow. But in this moment, all I have control over is all I have control over So I'm going out and I'm gathering sticks and I'm believing that if there is a God in the universe, that he might honor the fact that I'm doing the mundane even as I'm waiting on a miracle. Can we just gather some sticks? And because she honored her commitment, her commitment to be a mom, not a mom as long as everything was good, but just her commitment because she honored her commitment. Then we see the second piece. Oh my gosh. You gotta honor your commitment, but then if you're there already and you're like, Kyle, I need the next level, great. Here's the next one. I think we can all learn this no matter when and where you're watching. She then honors, honors her companions. <laughs> Some might even say her competitors. And we're gonna talk about what that looks like. Because it says, it says, so when he went to Zarephath, this is verse 10, when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? This is so powerful to me. Elijah was not from this area. In fact, Elijah probably should have been terrified to be In this area, the Bible actually says that he had to go to Zarephath. If you know anything about Zarephath, maybe you do, maybe you don't. (laughs) Probably not. That's why I'm here. It's okay. The Holy Spirit sent me for you. Uh, If you know anything about Zarephath, it actually was the birthplace of a woman by the name of Jezebel. Jezebel is actually ready to take Elijah's life. So Elijah is going into enemy territory. What does that tell me? That tells me that not only is Elijah going into enemy territory, but this woman would have naturally seen him not even as a companion yet, but as a competitor. And yet she hears this come from the man of God. I don't know if it's the tam in his voice. I don't know the ways he looked. I don't know if she thought maybe a blessing could come of this, but he says, can you give me a jar of water? And now in 2022, when I see somebody on the other side of the aisle that didn't like my post, uh, that did a story on the opposite side, I start competing. And this person saw a sworn enemy for her entire life and goes to get water. You know, I think the reason that she was so easily able to give up the water is because she knew it wasn't going to sustain her anyways. And maybe that's the issue with us. 
is that we actually think all the stuff that we're holding on to is going to sustain us. <laughs> Maybe that's the issue. Maybe that's the thing, is that you really feel like if you hold on to them extra $4 in your bank account, those are going to be the $4 that are going to change your life forever. Like, I deleted some apps in the last couple weeks because my heart was heavy, and I felt like I was starting to get a heart of stone instead of a soft heart. And I said, you know what? This thing I'm holding on to actually isn't able to sustain me anyways. Like, so what? Somebody going to like my picture four times, and now my life changes? Like, what is this, a golden ticket? Am I waiting for Willy Wonka around the corner? I think she realized that actually this water is not going to sustain me anyways. I'm preparing to make my last meal for my son was a jar of water. Can I ask, what are you holding on to? Maybe the issue is that we're holding on to things so tightly that God has asked. He hasn't texted you back in three days. Just delete his number. I just think that if we could be bold enough to let go of that thing that God is asking us to let go of, then we might have the miracle on the other side of the mission field God has placed us on. He give, she gives up the jar of water, and that was easy. But then my man doubles down, like, going to come into the town hungry. He ain't even from here. He calls her and asks, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, that lets me know she didn't even argue. She's like, fine. He ain't asked me to hold these sticks, but I guess I'll give him some water. He called, and bring me, please, a cheddar biscuit, okay? I want you to bring me one of them cheddar biscuits from Red Lobster. I heard y'all make them good over here in Zarephath. I want a Zarephath Golden Corral biscuit. Like, <laughs> I'm telling you, boy, I would break my waistline over Golden Corral right now. Like, he went he, a little bit further. What am I holding on to? Question one, but then the second question that maybe somebody wants to ask themselves. Can I let go a little more? I'm telling you, something about the water was cool with her I don't know why but for some reason she was okay giving up the water but I'm telling you somewhere Pastor Jim between the water and the wafer she was like I'm done I'm done I'm done I don't have anything she responded to the man and she said as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And can I tell you, I think as soon as she said that, the Holy Spirit released something in Elijah said, thank God that must have been why I came here in the first place. But I don't think she would have ever got that moment revealed to her if she hadn't been able to respond to the pressure and the pain of somebody bringing out the real issue. Can I tell you, that's why I love our small groups here. That's why I love our serve teams here. We're not just trying to get you in here so you can have a red shirt or you can serve online with our moderators and chat hosts. We're here because we want somebody in your life that is gonna ask you, to give a little bit more because maybe, just maybe, under the pressure of that tension that you're not used to, maybe, just maybe, that's where the breakthrough is going to happen as you talk about what's really going on in your life. Not your 401k, not everything that looks good, not coming in on a Sunday morning, high-fiving and saying I'm blessed and highly favored, but saying actually, just actually, my wife has a cancer diagnosis and I don't know what I'm going to do. This woman reveals what's really going on, and because she honored her commitment, and then she honored this companion or competitor, depending on how you see him, Elijah then said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do what you said. But first, first, seek you first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. First, bring your first fruits into the storehouse so that there may be blessing. First, make a small cake of bread for me from what you have. I'm not asking for what you don't, but of what you have, if you could bless me first and bring it to me, then make something for myself, for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up 
and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord gives rain on the land. She honored somebody that didn't look like her, act like her, talk like her, think like her, believe like her. She honored, oh man, she honored the commitment she had to this young son she had at home with all that she had left. But in the midst of that, what we actually see she did, she wasn't simply honoring a son. She wasn't simply being a blessing to Elijah. Actually, if we go back to the beginning of the story, we'll see what she was actually doing is honoring his command. And if we're going to run on empty and actually get to the end of a race, I think we're going to have to honor, yes, some commitments. Show up to work. Show up to church. I'm telling you the biggest blessings I've had have not been on the days where I'm saved, sanctified, and feeling fire baptized at home. It's of the days I don't feel like being here. Honor your commitments. Honor your companions. Honor the people that are next to you. Can we be a church that looks so peculiar that when everybody else is infighting and when everybody else is saying this is right and this is wrong, can we be a church that cuts through and says, how are you doing? Can we have a meal? Can we break some bread? That's how the Acts Church went crazy and started growing. It wasn't because of their political divides. It wasn't because of their statements. It wasn't because of their story posts. It was because they said, I don't care what your story is. You are too important for me to miss you and this miracle and she went and she served outside of her comfort zone outside of what she didn't have and she honored a command that was never hers in the first place it says sometime later if we go to the beginning of the story the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land then the word of the Lord came to him go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there I have commanded. 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 And as I was reading this, I, was, I realized, Anna, as I read this, I realized, oh, I thought this story, my whole life was about Elijah blessing a widow. How dumb am I? My whole life, I thought this story could have been about a widow blessing Elijah, gathering sticks and honoring somebody. And what I realized in a moment is actually, this story is about God honoring a woman in a far off land, a dark land. I mean, the shadow of death over that place would have been so strong. She literally has lost her husband. And somehow, in the midst of a desert, in the midst of a famine, before she even meets Elijah, God said, I already have spoken to this woman that you're about to go meet. I want to let you know that I don't want any credit for what God is doing today. Sometimes we do a bad job of giving ourselves credit. It's not the worship team. It's not a person with a microphone. It's not a social media post. The reason you are here today sitting in a seat is not because of anything I've done it's not because of journey church though I love journey church it's because God has commanded in a dark space in a space full of the shadow of death that he was going to speak to you and change your situation why because it's just what he does I, I don't know if it was day one of eating cake after that I don't know if it was day two of the dinner rolls I don't know if it was day six, but I think at some point, this woman's at home and she's realizing I was in a dark place and the savior of the world decided to light it up. When there was mountains between me and my miracle, he decided to move them, not because of who I am, but because of who he is. like a widow for a second not like the world not like we have it all figured out can we stand to our feet wherever you are whatever campus and just worship like a like worship like you're on empty 
and realize that the reason you're in this seat today is because God willed it and he wants to know you intimately. There's no lie of the enemy that he won't pull down. The reason you're here today isn't to sing some songs. The reason you're here today is because he loves you that much that he says, I want to have a conversation with you. So right now, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, I'm just going to pray for somebody here today. It's meeting that reckless love for the first time, or maybe it's the first time in a long time. I want to let you know the same way it found a widow thousands of years ago, it's finding you in the midst of the tumult, in the midst of the situations, in the midst of the circumstances, in the midst of the media, in the midst of the news. He found you and he has your heart right now. It's not about somebody on a microphone, but it's about everything that he is doing from his throne in heaven. If that is you and you want to enter into a relationship, Relationship, not simply religion that this woman would have known, but a relationship with the Father that will come and find you when you don't deserve it and when you can't earn it. I'm going to ask you, raise your hand on the count of three and put it right back down. That's all I'm asking you to do because I believe when you respond on the outside, it makes what's happening on the inside that much more real. One, two, three. Hands raised. I see hands raised right now. I see hands raised right now. I see hands raised right now. I'm believing hands are at Twinsburg. I'm I'm believing the hands are online. I'm believing the hands at Fairview Park. I believe it. Leave your hand there for a moment. Leave your hand for there for a moment. Let your spirit know that I'm turning full speed. I know that you asked me for water and now you want bread. I know you asked me for just to come to church and now you're asking for my life, but I believe it's worth it. If that's you under the sound of my voice, I'm going to ask you just to pray this simple prayer with me. 
You can say it under your breath. You don't have to out yourself. This is a conversation not from Elijah and not from a widow. It's from the God of the universe. So he already knows your heart. Simply say, Jesus, I give you my life. I believe that you sacrificed it all for me when I didn't earn it and when I didn't deserve it. You thought I was worth it. I thank you for dying on, on the cross for my sins and raising for my salvation. And so today I call myself saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we put our hands together for those people? Oh, come on. Come on. We can out shout these drums. All of eternity has changed for somebody, one person a day. And I know it makes all the difference. Man, I love you so much, Dirty Church. And every single campus, your campus leader is about to take it over now. I'm honored that you would be here. Enjoy the rest of your day. Can we give our God one more shout of praise?